Welcome to another exciting episode of KevJet, the podcast. I'm excited to introduce to you this week's guest, Isidro, choreographer and drag artist. Are you ready for this? Yes. Hit me. He tells us how he was inspired to start dancing. I just got hyper fixated on shows like uh, Britain's Got Talent and America's Best Dance Crew. And there was this one crew on America's Best Dance Crew called Fanny Puck. Something clicked then for me and I was like, I have to dance. I have to find a class. So my mum helped me look for a dance class and I had to catch two buses to the other end of Birmingham every Saturday and I loved it. Of course, the Kev Jet questions keep on coming. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> you did your research. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. Izzy recently landed his first ever West End job. What do you think it was? He tells us all the details. At the start of this year, I landed my first ever West End job, which was Priscilla the Parsi. Yeah, it was a fantastic experience. No Kevjet episode would be complete without hitting some hot topics. And this first one is on everybody's mind in the UK at the moment. We have to talk about the far right extremism that has been ignited by the murder of these three girls in Sunderland by a 17-year-old boy. First of all, racism is is taught. It's a learned behaviour. And that comes from a lack of information. It comes from a lack of education and from a sort of willful ignorance. It's, It's very hard to acknowledge something that doesn't get taught in schools. These people are kind of left in the dust and they sit at home and they watch the news and the news says immigrants are stealing your job and they believe it because what else do they have so i do feel a really great sense of empathy for these people um i don't agree with their views but i understand where they come from the british government and economy have really failed everyone for decades and then it's time for KevJet's quick fire questions. It's always time for something. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't say that. They'll sue me. God. Sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with the charming Isidro. Welcome to KevJet the podcast, Isidro, choreographer and drag artist. Hi, how's it going? Welcome. Yeah, very excited to do this. Thank you for having me on your show. It's going to be a fun conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Lots to talk about. Of course. Let's just start with the beginning. So tell me about your upbringing, because it's a mix between being raised in the UK and Spain, which is quite fun. Yeah, so I was born in Sheffield in 1994, and I... My family, we moved over to Cordoba in the south of Spain um, when I was around seven years old. So I went to primary school there, I went to secondary school there, and then we moved back to the UK to finish education studies. And then I went back over to Spain, but this time to Sitges, where I studied at the Institute of the Arts Barcelona. I was part of their first ever sort of cohorts of degree students so first ever graduates proper graduates that they ever had and after that I did a couple of jobs and then I moved to London and six years later here we are. (laughs) At what age were you when you realized arts was the direction you were going for? Hard question I think I because my my Mum used to be a dancer a long time ago, used to be a dancer and a teacher. Um, She sort of, she used to teach contemporary dance in Cuba for a while where she met my father. And my father was a very artistic man. He was a a painter. He was a a guitarist. He used to sing um, and he used to do martial arts and 
around the age of six, seven, I got into gymnastics. I was always very, you know, I used to sort of paint as well at home. Yeah, growing up, I always had all these artsy sorts of things around the house. Like my dad had these masks and paintings and they're all very, I uh, quite, I'd say gory, gory paintings, like very biblically horror themed, like, um, lots of skulls and demons and that kind of thing and so and monsters and that's always kind of crept in from a young age and then yeah I've always been very a very physical kid I got into gymnastics when I was around six seven got into kung fu when I was around 10 and then I remember around the age of 15 I was living back in the UK at this point and I just got hyper fixated on shows like uh, Britain's Got Talent and America's Best Dance Crew. And there was this one crew on America's Best Dance Crew called Fanny Puck. And it was led by Matt Cady. And um, there are some other really huge choreographers in there, like Megan Lawson. And um, I remember them sticking out to me a lot because they... They were competing with all these break dance crews and b-boys and sort of like real like foundation street dance crews but they were just kind of doing their own thing they were infusing sort of jazz technique and contemporary and gymnastics and a whole lot of queer energy into it and that really sort of something clicked then for me and i was like i have to dance i have to find a class so my mum helped me look for a dance class and I had to catch two buses to the other end of Birmingham every Saturday and I loved it and it's just kind of snowballed from there. And so now moving into like today, you're, you're teaching dance, aren't you? Yeah, so I started, I got into choreography when I started um my A levels as part of the curriculum and yeah I just immediately gravitated towards making choreography about really I'd say dark subjects for a teenager like particularly pertaining to mental health and asylums and emotions like loneliness and yeah and from there I've sort of been able to find a lot more joy in that experience and I've sort of taken it away from that and found the joy within the darkness but yeah I, I nowadays what I'm doing is I'm I just started teaching at the factory in North London teaching weekly classes and it's a sort of it's queer inclusive space it's um I'm aiming it at drag performers but everyone and anyone and everyone is welcome but yeah, queer led, queer inclusive dance classes and um, just a good all around fun time, like without the pressure of being in one of these larger London dance studios where you feel like you need to compete all the time. Feeling judged all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think with London sort of being the artistic hub that it is and particularly for universities like you have a, a, the biggest some of the biggest arts-led universities in the country in London and that draws a huge amount of students every year and it's also it just happens to be where a lot of the jobs are so there's a huge pool of performers living in London and they're all looking to train they're all looking to be seen they're all auditioning and so many of them are fantastic and it does weigh you down a lot sort of going to classes and feeling like you need to fight to be recognized when ultimately you bring it back and art is just supposed to be about expressing yourself and saying something and feeling good it's, it's creativity is just it's it's a way that we kind of connect with ourselves and express ourselves and I think you lose that in the hustle, of, hustle and bustle of London sometimes so what I'm trying to do is create just a, a space where people can just relax and 
take that pressure off a bit and so far so good it's it's growing and i'm very excited for the future of it that's exciting auditions have become very competitive now haven't they so you feel like you're just trying to prove yourself better than the next person always yeah i agree i think i mean that's always been the nature of auditions but i think now with there's there's been a boom in the amount of people who get recognized through social media so there's a lot of people who they they don't necessarily get the recognition they deserve because they don't have a big online following and they don't sort of seek out ways to network with people and I'm not saying that you should lean into that and um, be online and network with other artists but that is kind of the norm nowadays like you have to you have to put your art online and you have to record yourself and you have to go to class with the intention of recording yourself and I think it's important to remember that you know there was a time when that wasn't the norm and art was just for the sake of expressing yourself and connecting with other people and you, you can't really do that if you're determined to be perfect that's the same way in all forms of art right now because I was at a music industry expo type of meeting not that long ago and the head of record labels were basically saying they look at social media uh, before anything else and which is strange yeah and I think it it probably differs from art form to art form I think I think less physical art forms less body-based art forms so things like painting you can you can get away with not having as much of an online presence but things like singing dancing musical theater acting where your body is your tool essentially you do have to essentially sort of gift wrap that and market yourself and especially in the, the commercial dance industry just sort of taking the focus back to dance the commercial dance industry you really have to sell yourself it's kind of in the name and I think a lot of performers struggle well from my generation because the, the newer ones they've kind of grown up with this um so it's that's their norm and they excel at it and a lot of the ones from older generations they really struggle with having an online presence because there was a there was a before and there was an after for them almost there was less pressure to be online less pressure to be yeah perfect in how they express themselves and now they have to constantly think about how they're marketing themselves and we're in a day and age where people you you give someone your social media and they look how many followers you have or if you have that blue tick and and that's what determines yeah. things before they even look at your talent yeah it's um uh, uh the word i was looking for is individualistic we live in a very individualistic time now um everyone because because of the growth of the internet everyone is able to access content from people they would never have been able to in the past and they see these amazing dancers from all walks of life from all countries and they you just get it drilled into your head that you have to stand out you have to be unique and while I agree that yes you are unique you are a performer you are and you're a person you're a human first and foremost you are a unique individual but being unique and being a dancer don't necessarily go hand in hand unless you're exceptional because as a dancer you normally part of a cohort you don't really get soloists in commercial dance industries and it all comes back to that that individualistic dynamic that yeah and it's sort of a catch-22 because if you're out there at an audition and they're asking for your cv but say you're new, you're sort of new and you don't really have that cv but you also don't have the following. What's your advice to those new people just starting out and how do they stand out? To be perfectly honest, I ne wouldn't necessarily know. I 
kind of taken a step back from the dance industry in itself and I'm just sort of getting back into it in the last year I've just been getting back into it and I'm sort of becoming aware of the dynamics of what the industry looks like nowadays I remember back before um, particularly the pandemic I I would recommend you know go to classes network with people absolutely like make one new friend per class you want to follow industry professionals you want to find good agents and not all agents are the perfect fit for you you have to shop around it's the same you would do with say a therapist it's not one size fits all so there are many agents out there there are many agencies out there and you have to seek out the ones that represent you best and who have your best interests at heart and make sure that they sort of that you are working together to let's find the types of jobs that you want what is your dream role Oh, dream role is a hard question for me because I, I mean, are, are we talking about acting, musical theatre? What, what we anything about? the top of of all categories? God, I, I would love to be in a horror movie. That would that would be the pinnacle. I would love to play like the main monster in a horror movie i think i feel a lot of kinship with monsters so think about my my upbringing and what i had going on around me and the interests that i've developed and yeah i i love sort of creature design and i'd love to get into that somehow yeah <laughs> very very niche interest but I think that would I would find that a lot more fulfilling than being on a West End stage. What would be your dream role as a dancer? I would I'd love to be a backup dancer for an artist like FK Twix. You know, someone who is really specific in the type of art they create, like very alternative approach to music and sort of drawing from ballroom culture and contemporary dance and they get some some what i've been talking about this creature design and they they're a very experimental artist like people like that really inspire me so those are the people that i gravitate towards and if i was ever going to do a dance job for a backup as a backup dancer for someone with a big name yeah like FK Twigs, Lady Gaga, Chapel Roan, all these people who just, they, they play with their art. So I think it, it keeps the fun in the art, right? It's very uh, expressional as well. Yeah, yeah. I find that a lot more engaging than, you know, just being part of a, like very interesting visuals and not knocking any other artists uh, in, in that regard. Like, but I respond so much more to people who they they take that sense of individualism and they run with it and they let people be themselves on stage rather than just being part of a formation. Exactly. Yeah. Let's let's talk about what I'm hiding from you. Oh God. Uh <laughs> You did your research. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. Um, yeah, so what I'm hiding from you was a... I think Connor reached out to me. Um, so Connor's a director. They're um, uh, Connor Devlin Powell, I believe. They're a neurodivergent director. And they run, they're running this project at the moment called Batsy Ghoulbusters. They really respond to horror they um they reached out to me personally yeah so connor reached out to me last year um and was like hey i've got this idea um i know that you're a choreographer i know that you're a performer would you be interested in working with me on it i've got a camera person and it would just be the three of us working together um and essentially the movie is a 
short horror film about neurodivergent masking. And I, yeah, I, I said absolutely. Like, yeah, like I've always had this connection with neurodivergence because I myself am. And a lot of members of my family are, a lot of my closest friends are. Um, and that sort of thing, neurodivergence encompasses things like autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, the list goes on and on and on. But deviations from what is considered neurotypical in society. And yeah, when people who are neurodivergent go out in public, there's generally this this culture where they have to fit in and they have to behave themselves and they can't do things like stimming you know physical stimming where like maybe they shake or they sway or they they rock um maybe it's verbal stimming where they they copy like echolalia where they copy what the person has just said to them and um, they'll repeat it back to them it's almost like a way of reassuring themselves and there are a lot of spaces in society where that doesn't necessarily look good it's not a it's not a good look to be neurodivergent like say in an office space i think creatives get away with it a lot more because um being creative especially physically you can you kind of have an outlet for that a lot of neurodivergent people go undiagnosed because they discover art from a young age and then they they're constantly they they have a constant outlet for that neurodivergent expression and then they try to work an office job and suddenly they start to get more anxious and they sort of withdraw and retreat into themselves and not only do they stop being themselves but then they're they're almost called out for it they're almost punished for it when they then try to express themselves again in those spaces and yeah the, the movie it's five minutes but it's all about that and you should absolutely watch it and where can people find that um so i have a link on my instagram the sure. is shown at a couple of music uh film festivals around the uk i think the most recent one we've got coming up is it's being shown at the british urban film festival so you can go and watch it there um amazing the london for breeze film festival on the 27th of october um i think that's to be confirmed but i believe that's being shown what are some of your favorite shows that you've been in Ooh, what are they? I'd say a lot of the my favorite shows that I've been in recently are all sort of drag related. So there's Slay Station, which is a sort of recurring gaming themed drag night. It's hosted by a lovely trans lady called Velvet Capiat, and she has created. I, th I think the UK's first and one of the world's first gaming themed drag nights and it's just grown and grown and grown um so they'll maybe take the theme of action games or fighting games or horror games around Halloween and then all the performers have to come up with numbers themed around that there's also uh myself and one of my flatmates uh Bev they go by Bev drag performer and Goblin, another delightful drag performer. We all met doing um, a competition called The Next Drag Superstar UK and bonded over that. And we created this show led by Bev called Other Worlds, where um, I remember we had this conversation and we were like, Want, we want it to be like a Doctor Who episode, like they're traveling through space and time, these sort of adventurers, and they go to different planets, and that planet is the theme of each show. So we've done Planet Attenborough, we've done Planet Blue, where Bev's from, because she's a she's an alien from um they they sorry um Planet Planet Blue um which is the planet Bev is from, they're a blue alien, that's how they present the drag. Um, 
hadn't done Planet Halloween, but we did it in April because, of course, and it was Planet Halloween 2. Planet Halloween, Electric Boogaloo 2. No, it's something like that. Anyway, ignore me. Planet Cyborg. I really enjoy doing these shows where we kind of pick a theme and then we just get to run with it. And, you know, I can I can choose to do dance or I can choose to do sort of burlesque or there's a lot more variety in what I get to do. Um, I'm someone who gets bored easily. I'm trying to think. So I, str I struggle with longer contracts anyway, um, which is why I've sort of taken a step back from the dance industry. But now um, I'm looking to get back into that. I should probably talk about, so um, at the start of this year, I landed my first ever West End job, which was Priscilla the Parsi. Um, I loved, I loved, I loved. Yeah, it was a fantastic experience. Um, it's a revival of the the original musical and um, a sort of adaptation of it, a modernization of it in some ways. And um yeah, I really responded to that. I think if I was ever going to do a musical, that would have been the one. Um, because it's about drag performers and there's trans representation in there. And at the time, it was very forward thinking musical. Controversial. Yeah. It was controversial. Absolutely. Yeah. It really sort of blew the doors open for queer art on the West End. And you look at the results of that nowadays we have drag queens everywhere and Priscilla definitely contributed to that so yeah that was a really rewarding experience did you find it tiring was it was it grueling or was it just a, was it literally the party every day oh yeah no it was it's always a party but I <laughs> lord i get tired easily <laughs> i really struggled but it absolutely sort of reignited that spark that i needed to find after covid i think i sort of i really focused on drag for the last the previous three years and then throwing myself back into sort of dancing and sing not only dancing but singing live full time that was a challenge but I feel a lot more connected to my body now than before and yeah I'm ready for more. <laughs> well moving on to current events your social media has actually taken a turn with your views on the world events at the moment which I quite like because some people steer away from it and some people embrace it and you're not afraid to embrace it so let's talk about that. What's happening? God so so much where to begin so i think first off we have to talk about the far right extremism that has been ignited by the murder of these three girls in sunderland by a 17 year old boy and this is a optically this is a black boy who he was born in wales and then grew up in Sunderland and he murdered these girls and the result of that was a lot of anger from far right they were originally called by the media protesters and then correctly sort of pointed out by the media um, particularly by the Daily Mail and then that was challenged correctly by MPs like Zara Sultana for what it is to rename it, to address it, which is, you know, it's domestic terrorism and far right extremism. And it really is the result of something that's been kind of bubbling under the surface in the UK for many years, which is this this lack of addressing the racism that the media kind of propagates. These extremists were incorrectly labeling this boy an immigrant 
and the media kind of jumped on the word immigrant and fans the flames. And before you knew it, we had people being chased down the streets. We had a kind of indiscriminate, but anyone who looks like an immigrant for the last week or so, we've had um, NHS workers from the Philippines having bricks thrown at their head. We've had cars flipped over and torched. We've had um hotels set on light uh, hotels set alight with people inside them we've had police stations vandalized which is the really crazy one when you look at what these extremists are trying to achieve um people running around with chainsaws it has been insanity for the last couple of weeks but you sort of you ask all of the people of color in this country none of us are surprised and it's kind of reignited these conversations that were happening around 2020 when the George Floyd protests were happening and I think the reason why a lot of people are feeling more passionate about it nowadays is because it's so much closer to home it's very much within our country and it's started a lot of very interesting conversations around race which I'm pleased to see but it's also brought up a lot of anxieties and fears that um, immigrants and people who look like immigrants and people who are related to immigrants have been feeling for years. It's bringing up really important conversations. And I think education is the word that people should be looking for instead of the racist comments that they're coming out with. They should ask the questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think the problem with the racism in the UK and, you know, it's not so that it's when people think of the word racism, they usually think of these right wing extremists and these extremists, they're usually painted in a certain way. They're painted as working class people, they're painted as uneducated, they're painted as sort of benefit scroungers, minor- like and a minority in their numbers. And I do agree with that. I don't think that the UK has a huge number of people who will go out and smash up shops and persecute people physically. But the racism in this country has been ingrained for centuries and it's a lot more subtle and there's this sort of deniability around having those conversations in the first place because it's it's very hard to acknowledge something that doesn't get taught in schools you know I was working in a predominantly Muslim secondary school a a couple of years ago and I was first of all amazed because I learned more about the Islamic golden age than I ever had in my life uh, in my you know I'm in my late 20s and I'd never really heard about that information and you know this this information is not necessarily readily available to the British public but we owe things like mathematics algebra medicine um lemons coffee so many things that were brought over to this country by these immigrants who the far right are trying to drive out and you know you you look at why that is why they have those beliefs and it's first of all because it's not taught it's not readily available information this is information that if you're not looking for it you have to go out and seek it otherwise you're ignorant to it um in this in the uk we rarely get taught about the british slave trade but Liverpool was one of the biggest slave ports in the country. These people were ancestors of many of the people who you walk past in the street today. And that's not to say that they themselves are racist. I I don't believe that racism, first of all, racism is is taught. It's a learned behaviour. And that comes from a lack of information. It comes from a lack of education and from a sort of willful ignorance you you do have to seek out this information and I think there is almost an encouragement to turn a blind eye to it and to shift the focus to 
we call I'll call them British issues, and um, I'll give World War the World Wars as an example. After the World Wars, millions of Indian workers were brought over to the UK to help rebuild the country because we lost so many of our soldiers during the war, and those people are rarely, in my experience, remembered during events like Remembrance Day, which is a huge thing in this country. And I, I used to be in the Army Cadet Force for a year, and I quickly changed my mind about joining the, joining the Army, and I <laughs> decided to sort of inhabit more welcoming spaces because um, there is this sort of undercurrent of racism within the British Army. They They forget that so many other countries, third world countries, provided soldiers for the British and this is yeah this isn't readily available information if you're not willing to go out and seek it and you have to ask yourself why is this information not in British textbooks why is it not remembered on Remembrance Day why is this information sort of gate kept by the by the education system by the media and we do have some very high profile right wing media producers we'll talk about the daily mail and the headlines that they produce they just kind of fan the flames of the ignorance and they you know you repeat the word immigrant enough times to someone who is financially struggling uneducated and that person is eventually going to share those views and if they're a person who you know, I, I feel a sense of empathy towards these right, right wing extremists. You have to feel sorry for them because they don't know better. There are many people in British society who do know better. And these people are high profile people. They are educators, they are politicians, they are doctors, they are lawyers who gatekeep this information. They are, and they, they just sit back and they let these right-wing protesters take the blame for the racism. A lot of these people in high-profile positions um, and high-paying jobs, they're sort of protected from scrutiny and criticism that in the way that people who experience poverty are not. You can let the fires happen around them. It's important to remember how much language matters. And just because someone hasn't had the same educational success or the same wealthy upbringing doesn't mean that they don't respond to language so you repeat the word immigrant enough times that forms a certain image in your head i think for a very long time people associated the word terrorist with a certain kind of imagery and we've started unpacking that and dismantling that but we've still got a long way to go and I think when people think of the word racist, that immediately creates a certain imagery of a, a low class, uneducated, um, unhygienic, stupid kind of person. And that's so wrong. You don't have to be poor to be a racist. That's so true. It's so true. And, and and that's what the media portrays as well. And even last night with the so-called protests, those were mm. the people that were, they were interviewing. They were trying to show that that's, that that's what we should all look at when you think of the word racist. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a manipulation tactic and it's a, it's a polit political manipulation tactic and it's a, distancing De of the self. deflective was the word i was looking for yeah it is it's so deflective um because i think like if you imagine a spectrum you've got right-wing extremists at one end you've got anti-fascism at the other end and in the middle in this gray area you have all these wishy-washy people who say i'm not racist but then they are usually the people who are who are culprits of microaggressions. They are 
they're the people who you'll be on a night out and they'll be like, oh, can I, I love your hair, can I touch it? And with all worse, they don't ask for permission. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think they, they're the people who, God, I hate to say it, but um, it, it comes back to the performing arts industry as well, but like people who fake tan just a tad too much and um people who they appropriate hairstyles they appropriate black language from um particularly from the ballroom scene and that kind of, that's kind of trickled down from um drag race becoming such a mainstream source of queer representation in the media um and I have spicy views about drag race, but we can sort of keep those. <laughs> that's so, another podcast. That's a different podcast. I understand why people sort of avoid the subject of racism in this country because they racism is generally equated with the imagery that happened in the past. You know, the slave trade, lynch mobs, um, police brutality in the states nowadays. But the racism in this country is a lot more subtle and it's represented in the ways it's represented in the wages that people receive. It's represented in the demographics of your workspaces, like how many people of color are working in your office versus not. If we look at these these right wing protesters, they're sort of they're out on the streets and they're shouting about, "Give us back our jobs! Give us our jobs back!" Well, think about the jobs that they are trying to drive these people out of. These are jobs that they don't want, and it's things like cleaners, taxi drivers, hairdressers. These people aren't stealing jobs from white people. They do they immigrate to this country. They, they're shopkeepers they are they are nurses that these people don't come over to this country and steal jobs from white people um and worse some of these people are born in this country and they are under threat because they look like an immigrant but they came to british schools they got a british education they they had a British education they went to a british university and they worked their asses off to get a high paying job. And then apparently that equates to stealing a job from someone who is on benefits. And when you look at the root of the problem, there's, there's this class divide that's been happening in the country for decades. And the conservative government particularly fans the flames of that and then um, they they created less jobs, sort of point the finger at immigrants as the reason why people aren't getting jobs. But when you look at the reality, it's that there are jobs, but they're harder to get. There's more competition. They don't pay well enough. Um, people feel very isolated in that poverty. And it's it's harder to see in bigger cities where you you do have more jobs there is more availability but if you're if you're a working class um if you're a working class white british citizen and you live in a smaller community and there aren't really any opportunities for you then i imagine that does feel incredibly disheartening and you know what are your options you have to move to a big city or you have to go on benefits you, you'd have to if you're a working class person in the uk you have to move to a big city to find opportunities where the rent is increasingly mm. um the, the rent is getting increasingly higher and you're also competing with thousands of people i did watch a really interesting video the other day about how a lot of companies you know, if you if you send out a hundred job applications, I'll have to find this video, but if you send out a hundred job applications, there is a three percent chance of you getting that job, getting a job, and I think getting an interview. And then there are stages to that interview. There's multi-stage interviews, 
all these huge companies, these tech companies, these business companies, you know, they don't make it easy for people to access jobs in the first place. And then, um, you know, if you compare someone who they they were able to afford to go to university, they got that education, and you compare that to someone who they've been struggling and they've been on benefits their whole life, who are they going to give the job to? Mm -hmm. Probably the person who went to university, probably the person with the education. And then these people are kind of left in the dust and they sit at home and they watch the news and the news says immigrants are stealing your job and they believe it because what else do they have? So I do feel a really great sense of empathy for these people. Um, I don't agree with their views, but I understand where they come from. The British government and economy have really failed everyone for decades. You know, the, the media and social media, all of this will naturally die down over the next few weeks and people will go back to what they consider the norm. And what the norm is, is not talking about racism and how it affects people's job opportunities. I remember the first job I ever applied for. I I sent my C I I because you had to, we didn't have the technology back then. You walk around with your CV, and this was only like 10 years ago. I had to walk around with my CV and hand them into places. And um, you know, they they don't really it it helps put a face to a name, but you know, you go out, you hand out your CVs. And I did that. And I did the smart thing. I started chasing them up by phone, um, calling up these places, just checking in. Hey, haven't heard anything from you. Are you still interested? I'd like to chase this up. And the job that I eventually got, it was as a bar back for a queer venue. But I remember the person over the phone was surprised by the sound of my voice because they read my name on the CV and they saw Isidro and they immediately assumed that I was a foreigner and they immediately assumed certain things about me and I do think that that is still an issue nowadays where whereas you know there's hundreds of people competing for the same jobs and that racism is still ingrained within the system and if you have a person with a foreign sounding name and a person with a British sounding name and you compare those two CVs for the same job and they have the exact same qualifications, the exact same education, they're the same age, they're possibly the same gender too. I think a lot of these larger companies gravitate towards the names that they recognize. Like they find reassurance in surrounding themselves with people who look like them and have similar views to them because they don't feel challenged in how they express their whiteness in that way. And I think a lot of workplaces really struggle with having people of color in, thrown into the mix. And maybe that person, there's one or two, um, but those people have to behave in a certain way in the workplace. I'm thinking about how certain black hairstyles up until a few years ago were completely unacceptable in offices. And I'm talking about things like locks and braids, and these are like protected hairstyles that people use for like the health of their hair. And also there, there's a certain level of um, the uh, this perception of these hairstyles being unhygienic or being um, provocative, like they evoke this perception of someone being a bit rough around the edges and they they listen to rap music and <laughs> I it's not the case in the slightest but um mm. that was an issue and I, I still believe it's an issue um nowadays uh it's little things like that the racism in this country is so subtle you have to look for it and if you're not looking for it and you're not having those conversations, you're blissfully unaware of it and everything feels fine. And then when your black friends on social media start popping off about the racism's existence, it I imagine it does feel extremely uncomfortable for people to address that. Um, it's, it's very hard to confront yourself, first of all, um, 
I think everyone struggles with that, like just analyzing how you think and why you think in that way. And when it paints you in a certain light and it's associated with a word like racism, it doesn't make you feel good about yourself. And a lot of people bury their heads in the sand and they end those conversations and they accuse these people. I've, I've been accused of being aggressive in the last week by more white men than the in the last four years you know in in the space of the last week um i wouldn't say that i'm an aggressive person um, <laughs> no i mean you know i i go out of my way to to not be an aggressive person i, I got a haircut recently um and i look blacker than ever i just um normally i have colored hair and now it's it's gone it's black and I, I remember when I had locks lo a couple of years ago. Um, I, I, you you notice the way that people look at you in public, like you walk past them on the train, uh, on the, you walk past them on an escalator, you walk past them on the tube on the street, and they there is this tension in the air, and you you I. I really can't describe it other than almost a sense of fear from the right person in that equation. And I think a lot of people of color can sort of attest to this. Um, there's also things like the, the almost intentional mispronouncing of names that a lot of people experience, which is, you know, I understand some names are hard to pronounce if you've not grown up with those names in your in your midst. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those conversations that I've overheard where people have difficult to pronounce names, they um they they always have to have a nickname or the 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 white person in that conversation will be like, Do you have a nickname? How do I pronounce that? Ooh, um that's oh that's exotic sounding um uh there's there's always the question where are you from where are you from is such oh my goodness a convoluted question when you boil it down to the roots of what the person is asking because what they uh, where what are, what are they asking where what are you country from? what country you're yeah. from yeah obviously you're not from here yeah yeah like there's this instant belief that you can't possibly be from the UK if you're a person of colour. <laughs> and the right-wing media have done everything in their power to encourage that kind of thinking. You see these people and they're, they're talking on the phone in public in their language, and that immediately instills a sense of fear in a British person. And I, I, I sort of, I watch these dynamics, like I'll be on the tube and I, uh, there's no signal underground. I <laughs> be on, um, on the bus and you hear a person of color talking on the phone in their language, in their native language. And all of the white people on the bus, like a large percentage of them, they will look over their shoulder. They will show contempt in their face. It's sort of like a, a, general sense of disapproval and judgment and from the person of color's perspective they are immediately sort of put in the crosshairs of being perceived as a threat and when you're perceived as a threat that for for years of your life that then has psychological effects on you. Well, let's move into some um, Capjet quick fire questions. Are you ready for this? Yes. Hit me. Alrighty. Favorite age so far? Favorite age? Favorite age? What a question. Um. Gosh, I would, I would say. <laughs> Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Fresh out of uni, very sort of optimistic, naive outlook on life. Um, I don't look back on that and sort of regret it and I'm not bitter about it. Um, but there was a, a sense of joy and freedom 
in that age, I think, um, as a new performer in the industry. 22 is my lucky number. Oh, yeah. There you go. Mind you, then. <laughs> Describe yourself in one word. Polarizing. <laughs> That's a great one. No one's ever used that one before. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is your bed made right now? Um, it is. I'm sitting on it. <laughs> uh -huh. Finish the phrase. The way to my heart is... Mm. Oh, yeah. The way to my heart is kindness. I love that. Do you have a hidden talent? I think I learned this from an episode of Desperate Housewives when I was a teenager. Um, I can say the alphabet backwards in six seconds. Oh, my goodness. Am I right? Um, <laughs> Z-Y-S-W-E-T-S-I-Q-P-O-N-O-K-J-H-E-F-N-D-C-B-A. How long was that? Wow, that was under six seconds. I think it was. <laughs> Hell yeah. Wow, you go. Oh, couple threat. <laughs> Desperate Housewives was my favorite. Uh -huh. What never fails to make you laugh? Men. Um, <laughs> detriment, um, derogatorily, men. <laughs> um, no, not that. Actually, yeah, men, derogatorily. Um, Derogatorily a word? I don't think so. <laughs> it is now. It is now. It is now. Trendsetter. Do you believe in ghosts? Absolutely. But I do I, I think it's like a, a scientific thing. You know, energy can't be created or destroyed. It has to go somewhere. Um, I, <laughs> I actually live opposite a graveyard. I'm looking at headstones right now. And... Um, uh, that is an unnerving thought, having said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's your view from your bed. Yeah, yeah. I wake up every morning and I'm reminded of how lucky I am to be alive. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, love ghosts. Do you have any tattoos? I have five. My favourite one is this one on my wrist where you normally wear a watch, which says, it's time. It's always time for something. Amazing. Cannonball into the pool or dip a toe in first? Oh, God. I think I'm a dipper. I would dip my toe in. Very much someone who... who watches other people do something first before trying it. Okay. What is the last thing you Google searched? <laughs> <laughs> Whooping cough outbreak, I think. Random. Yeah. But always good to know. Yeah, always good, good to know. What motivates you the most? I think, I think time, I think. Um, that's why I got this tattoo. I think... I'm always aware of how fleeting life is, which is why I care so much about the things I do. You know, we're only here for so long. We've got to make the most of everything, right? 100%. What is your deepest fear? Um, oh, I, just... I think for someone who loves horror so much, I really... Someone who loves horror so much, I really struggle with knowing what I'm actually afraid of and I would say being someone who's quite altruistic I do care a lot about the people I love getting hurt not so much um like your common fears so much it's just fear always comes back to a very philosophical place for me Sure. What do you think most people misunderstand about you? God, I think people look at me and they look at my online presence and they see an angry black man. And first of all, I don't identify as a man. I am gender fluid and embracing that fully. And I also think that there is such a thing as healthy anger. Um, 
you know, it's an emotion. You, we all experience anger and there are, there is a healthy way to express it. There are ways that anger can be used in a right, in a correct way. What is your favorite movie of all time? Ah. Oh, God. Um, oh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's probably gonna. It's a horror movie, of course it is. You know, I'll, I'll say I love Ridley Scott's Alien. That's like way up there for me in terms of creature design and strong female leads. Um, they didn't quite get it right with the first movie, but by the sequel, my God, I think Aliens. Aliens is top of the list. Loved that. Yeah. What is your guilty pleasure? <laughs> I know it's hard because do I feel guilty about that? Um, I never feel guilty about anything. Yeah, like why would you feel guilty about things that you love? Um, I think maybe one <laughs> one thing that I love, which a lot of people probably struggle with, is that. There was a period of my life where I used to watch videos of tarantulas before bed. Um, I I just find them really relaxing to look at, which is wild. Again, that's a first. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> what is your favorite part of your daily routine? God, I'd have to have a daily routine in order for that to be <laughs> answerable. I, I lack routine. I, I really enjoy going some some form of exercise, some form of exercise on a daily basis. I'll usually spend a couple of minutes dancing every day, I think, just to just keep moving uh, uh, yeah no i'll um i'll spend a a couple of minutes dancing every day that's usually the best part can you describe me in three words describe you in three words good listener is two words engaging welcoming and you're a handsome chap Ooh, yeah. thank. And I didn't even have to pay you for that one. No. <laughs> Normally I charge for that. <laughs> I'm writing that one down. Ha have you ever gone on a solo trip? In ways, yeah. I think every every foreign country that I visit, um, and I'm thinking France, Japan, South Africa, like I've always managed to find moments of solitude wherever I go. Um just I, I enjoy the feeling of being lost in a new place. I'm planning my first solo trip in September. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm doing it. Nice. Yeah, it's good for you. It's good. Have you ever had a costume malfunction on stage? <laughs> so many. <laughs> um, let me think of a good one. Oh, absolutely. So I used to work for... Uh, I, I can't say that. They'll sue me. God. You used, they to, would, you yeah, used to work for a... <laughs> they would actually sue me. Um, <laughs> I used to work for a very high-profile theme park um, with lots of colourful characters. And there was one day where, in the middle of a show, half of my costume dropped to the floor. And I was supposed to be a blue deity of sorts, shall we call it. And I think what the audience got was a blue deity from the waist up and black hairy legs from the waist down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was quickly escorted off the site. <laughs> what is one thing people consider trashy that you consider classy? Oh, expressing your views online. I think we live in the day and age of social media. I think there is such a thing as being chronically online. So I try to balance 
how vocal I am on social media with just shutting down and spending time by myself off the internet and going outside and going to the gym. But, you know, it's very hard not to be online these days, especially if you're neurodivergent. It's, it's, phones are so entertaining, aren't they? <laughs> How do you start your day with a positive kickstart? I take my anxiety medication. <laughs> Not that. Uh, <laughs> no. I'll I'll down about a liter of water first thing. Um, because I will forget during the day, and at least that way I'm hydrated for most of the morning. What is your favorite body part? Ooh, I really respond to eyes. I find eyes so interesting. Yeah. Love that. How would you title this chapter of your life? Oh, I did. I think this is the title of, I don't know, a show or a book that I'm going to write one day. Uh... I did jot it down. A friend suggested that I do it. Um, finding joy in weird places. That's a good one. Yeah. What makes you feel unstoppable? It's like prior knowledge. I think I've learned a lot of things in a very short space of time. Um, like complete overhaul of my life and who the person I the, the person I was. Um really in the last five years I've gained a lot of confidence in myself and the type of person I want to be. And I could not have done that without some really tough life lessons. Hindsight. Last question, and I ask all my male guests, what does being a man mean to you? Uh, I don't identify as a man nowadays. I think the word man has a certain connotation to it um, that I just, I don't really connect with anymore. Like I... I know I talked about my father at the beginning of this podcast and if I had the energy to hate him I would um this and the same applies to a lot of men who I've met who I've stumbled across um being a man to me I would say it means being incomplete because it almost rejects a healthy level of femininity and feminine energy that all men should be in touch with. And that is the answer that everybody has given me. A. Hey. Love it. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> we all we all we have a group chat. I wasn't sure where we were going with that, but you hit it. <laughs> we got there. We did. Love that. Thank you for our chat. We definitely um, ran over and uh, <laughs> it was great. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed rambling about things I care about. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank yeah. you very much.